Uh, well, happy Father's Day, everybody. We're really excited you're here. Um, I can't believe it's already mid-June. How is that possible? Um, but I hope you guys are having a great summer. Um, Father's Day is, uh, is, is such a fun day for dads because it's the day where they, like, can justify taking naps. That's how I feel today, to justify taking a nap and not feeling guilty. Um, but dads are a different breed uh, than moms. You think about moms and Mother's Day, you talk about how sweet they are and how wonderful and, you know, caring and nurturing, and they're always, you know, making sure everything's okay. And then dads, it's kind of a different story. It's like, dad, like, chucks me across the room and stuff like that. That's like what dad does. So I have a couple like dad-mom comparisons here that I'll show you, kind of just to compare like how moms and dads are. You know, there's like a mom sleeping. It's beautiful, just sweet, and dad just drooling. And uh, um, next one there, you can just kind of go through these. There's like mom and the dad. I think there's a kid in there somewhere. I have done that before. Not necessarily on their head, but like around them to kind of harness them in. Um, I like that one. It's my favorite. It's like the dad Halloween, the mom Halloween costume and the dad Halloween costume, which is hilarious. There's mom and dad there. And then I think there's one more or two more. Dad's hanging by the foot. How many dads have done like the beard, the Santa Claus beard on the face thing? Yeah, that's pretty fun. So dads, dads are like, a, I mean, part of being a dad is kind of going off script and uh, doing things a little different. And if there's something slightly dangerous, we will probably do it. Um, I think it's like in the dad DNA. It's like part of the deal, right? Um, so being a dad is super fun. I mean, I, was, I remember when I was a kid, and I just wanted to be a dad so, so, so badly. And then, and then I, I, I have three kids, and, and it's just the best, the best life. And they're such a blessing, and they're so fun, and they're so exhausting all at the same time. And there's days where just like we're shipping them away. And then there's days where you're like, oh, this is the best, right? Anyone else want to ship your kids away sometimes? Just me. Thank you. Yes. All right. Good. I don't feel judged. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, but, but, but Father's Day can also be kind of an awkward day or a hard day. You know, not, not all of us, like, my dad is a great dad. He's like, this, you know, he's kind of like relaxed and chill and he can fix and build anything, you know, and he like, he has a, he built his own cabin in the woods like with his bare hands, you know, it's just like so awesome, you know, and he's so loving and caring and giving, and so I was like really blessed and fortunate, I know more and more, to have like a dad that I can call anytime, and he's going to pray for me, uh, be there for, for me, um, encourage me, you know, I remember when, when Rachel and I were, were, were dating, and we were going to we wanted to get married, and, and he was like, you know, sometimes it's okay to wait. And he was giving me all this, like, fatherly advice, you know, because uh, uh, that's what he does, you know. My dad's great. Uh, but not everyone has that opportunity. Not everyone has been dealt that hand. So for some, a lot of people, Father's Day is a tricky, tricky day because, uh, you know, maybe your dad wasn't the dad you wished he would be. Maybe you never knew your dad, you know. One of the most beautiful things that we get to experience as followers of Jesus, is to be always and fully connected to scripturally what, what we know as our Heavenly Father. And God, throughout the, from the beginning of the book to the end, is called our Father. And, uh, and so regardless of whether your dad was this great, you know, titan man, you know, like, or, you know, you're, it's disappointing, or it, you have no idea, um, God is there to really be a father to us. And he can do that for anyone. And, and it's one of the things we find refuge in and we find solace that, that God is our father and uh, we, can, we can learn what it means to have a good dad. No matter what. No matter how old you are or young you are, God can be your father. So we're going to talk about that today. And this might be like a stretch for you, right? I know people that really struggle with God as your heavenly father because they connect it to their earthly father. Like how can I see these two things as the same? It's not the same at all. So today, my prayer today for all of us is that we would know the Father's love a little more than we did than when we sat down today, right? And the beautiful thing is, each day till the day we go and are with him face to face, complete and whole, we get to learn more and more about that. And it only gets better and better and better. So let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for you today. We thank you that you, you call us your children and you love us. And Lord, I pray right now for each one of us, that might be a struggle, that might be a stretch, but God, I pray that your spirit would make the Father's heart known today in this place. And we love you and thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
One of my favorite lines in the, in, in the, in the scripture is when Jesus gets baptized. This is the whole, the whole essence of this morning. Uh, and the, the verses will be on the screen today. It's Mark chapter 1, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting, and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The heavens opened, and a voice said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Uh, and the translation of that is that the heavens were ripped open for a moment, and a voice from heaven came down to, to Christ, to Jesus, and God says, he declares it to all who are there, that you, you are my son, my beloved. With you, I'm well pleased. And that, that sentence is going to be the whole morning that we talk about. You are my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. I, I try to say that to my son sometimes. I say, Isaac, you are my son in whom I love. In my God voice, which is pretty low and bassy, but... <laughs> I'm a tenor, so I have to work hard for that one. Um, and he says, you are my son, and it's a, it's a, it's a public dec declaration um, to the people around, but, but it's also such a personal statement. You are my beloved son. Jesus, before he's done any of his ministry, before he's done anything that we know of him to be, coming the Savior, to go to the cross, to resurrect, to ascend, to give us the spirit to change and transform the whole world, the Lord declares in this moment that this is my son, my beloved. I'm pleased with him. We're going to look at that statement in three little parts here. The first one is, you are my. You are my. And God's declaring to everyone that this is my boy. This is my son. This, this one, he belongs to me. He's mine. It's almost like an ownership, like he's mine right there. When I was a kid, my parents would like, we'd have like Christmas programs at school, you know? And then and they, they brought their little camcorder that they put on their shoulder, because that's what you did. <laughs> that's what you did before you had your phone like this. You had your camcorder you put on your shoulder. And I remember we had this Christmas program one time, and I, I didn't have any parts in the play or anything like that. I was just in the chorus part. And, the, and we got home and we turned on the video, and it was just like my face the whole time for like an hour, and just like, I'm like sitting there because I'm not saying. And then I would sing. And I'm like, Dad, like this is really boring. Like we have no idea what's going on in this program. And, he, and he, his thing was like, I don't care what's going on in the program. I want to know what's going on with you. All eyes. You know, think about like I go to my kids' programs now and they're not good. I'm just saying. <laughs> they are not good. It's like, really? Do we have to hit a wood block a thousand times with 40 people? Um, that was a little rant. But that's okay. They're not good. But the, all eyes are on Isaac, right? All eyes are on Ella. All eyes are on them. The whole time. Because they are mine. Those are my kids. Those are the ones that represent me. They're the ones that I own to some respect. Jesus says that I and the Father are one. There's this oneness. And, with, and the, the words you are my is a statement of this is my boy. This is mine. This is my kid. There's something profound about that. You know, I love other people's kids. I love everybody's kids. It's awesome. But, I, but my kids are my kids. You know, forever, like, they'll be the three most important, four, most important people in my life, right? And when they go and they leave me, it'll be the saddest day ever. Or maybe it'll be happy. It depends on how it goes. But it'll, be, but it'll also be forever, no matter what happens, they will be mine. And I will, I, will, I will look on them as my son and my two daughters. And I'll think about them every day and I'll pray for them the most than anyone else because they are mine. And Jesus is, was God's only, one and only son. And God told everyone, he is mine. He is mine. I don't want you to make any assumptions. I don't want anyone to be confused about that. I don't want anyone to wonder who he is. I am God above, and this is my son. So he represents me, 
and he speaks for me, and he, and he carries on the things that I instill in him, you know? Like, I, some, I remember one time when I was in high school, I was with my dad at with this museum, and he was walking around, he was, like, standing this way. It was, like, I can't remember what it was, but I remember thinking, like, man, my dad is such a dork. And then about three years ago, I was walking, and I was looking at something. I was doing the exact same thing. I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm a dork. <laughs> But it was like really a profound moment of like, you know what, at the time I didn't want to be like him, but now if I get to be like him, that's pretty good. And that's what Jesus got to be to the earth, to all of humanity. He, had to, he got to be the flesh and the blood and the ownership and the person of God to show us who the Father was, to love like the Father what does. In First Peter, 2, 9 through 10, it says this. But you are the chosen ones by God, chosen for a high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and to speak for him, to tell others of the day and night difference he made for you. For nothing, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. You are the chosen ones. The interesting thing about my kids, I didn't necessarily choose them. Right? Not that I would trade them, but I'm saying I didn't necessarily choose them, right? Like they're, they're from us. They're part of us. They carry half of us, right? I didn't necessarily choose them, but in God, he not only made us, but he also chose us. He says, you are the chosen people of God, and he chose you. He created you. He designed you. You are chosen by him. You are his. It's not that he's like, oh, man, I got to take care of George again. Golly. It's like, that's my boy. This is my girl. There's a verse that says that we have the privilege to be called the sons and the daughters of God because we were chosen by him. We were brought back into his fold, into his family, and through the life and love of Christ and his death on the cross, and he calls us his, every one of us. And I think sometimes just being a good dad or being a good mom is just knowing that, you know, you, you three little terrorists are mine. Right? You three are mine, no matter what, you're mine. And you represent me. I'm going to sow into you, and I'm going to put into you all the things I think that are good, and you're going to do bigger and better and beyond things than I could ever think or imagine. Because he's mine, and she is mine. And I tell them at night, the last thing we say before we go to bed is we say, we love you, and I say, I'm glad you're my son. I'm glad you're my girl. And then they say, I'm glad you're my daddy. Whew, Father's Day. <laughs> Father's Day tears. Here we go. Uh, moving on. God chose you. Next one. You are my beloved son. So all through the scripture, the Lord calls us his beloved. Like when, when he speaks to you, he doesn't just call you by name. He calls you his beloved. It means you're chosen and marked by his love. We are... Beloved love, or what it means to be beloved, is an enduring, intimate, unconditional, supernatural, godly love. So the same word is used when they talk about husband and wife, husband and wife relationships, that intimacy that only you have with your husband or your, with your spouse. Being beloved is, is it's a godly love that we can't create. We can't manufacture it. We can't be that. We can have moments of that, but it only comes from God because he's perfect and his ways are perfect, and his love is perfect, and that love covers and shields and protects and is the way he sees us. We are his beloved, and he calls us that. And he calls us that as a reminder that we, it doesn't matter what we do, well, it does matter what we do in the scheme of our life, but it, what we do doesn't change the way he sees us. In my lowest points, he called me his beloved. In my most holy points, he calls me his beloved. It doesn't change. I'm his beloved. And when he talks to you, you should, you should understand that he's calling you son or daughter because you're his, but he's also saying, and the love I have for you is unbreakable, and the love I have for you is perfect, and the love I have for you is not conditional on what you've done for me. Because Jesus hadn't done anything yet. He just got baptized. And then he goes into his ministry, and then he transforms the world. But in this moment, he hadn't done all the stuff. He hadn't really healed anyone yet. He hadn't really done miracles. He was just his boy, and God called him his beloved because 
His love for us is not contingent on what we do. His love stays the same and is complete. It's perfect. In Luke 15, there's the story of the prodigal son, which I love. I love that story. We'll probably talk about that in depth in the future for lots of weeks. But the story is basically that, that um, there's two brothers, and the younger brother says, you know what, I've, I've kind of had it with this, this, this living here. Father, he goes to his father, and he says, I want my, my, want my inheritance. I'm going to go, and I'm going to go live it up, go whoop it up. That's what they used to say, I guess. And um, so the father says, okay, sounds great. He gives him his inheritance. He goes, and he does wild living, right? And whatever that means to you, however that would project in you, to mean wild living for you. Um, and he goes, and he, and he squanders all of his inheritance. He squanders everything his father had worked for, half of everything his father had worked for. And he, and he basically disowned his father, left, just lived it up as much as he could, and he finds himself in the with nothing in, the, in a gutter. And he's working for a pig farmer, and he's thinking about even eating the pig farmer food, right? The slop. He's like, man, even our like, hired hands had a better life than this back home. And he thinks, maybe my father will take me back and let me be a hired hand. Maybe my father will let me and be on the bottom again because of all of what I did. I don't deserve it. So the son decides to go back. And, uh, and, and I'm going to read this. this. This is the scripture. His father had been waiting on the front porch. You know, probably in a rocking chair. I don't know if those existed. But maybe, you know. But the father was waiting on the front porch. And it says, And he arose and he came to his father. And while he was still away off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And I, I love the thought of while he was still way down the road. One, of the, one version says, and while he could barely see him coming, that means his father was straining his eyes as far as he could see, waiting each and every day for his son to return. And while he was still a ways off, he didn't stand on the porch and be like, now come, ask for forgiveness. father ran to him and embraced him and kissed him and called him beloved because the father's love wasn't contingent on what the son did with his inheritance or on how he lived this father this love was contingent on him being his son and no matter what he's my son he's my beloved and his love was perfect and while he was still a ways off he ran to him and he pulled him back in and that's the way God loves us. And while we many times see God as the father who's waiting on the porch and you have to kind of lowly come to him like this, head down, where he's going to tell you all the things you did wrong and, man, it's been two and a half weeks since you sat with me and you didn't even open your Bible this week or you didn't even, or I heard what you said or I know what you thought, oh my goodness. While he was still a ways off, the father ran to his son. And while you feel like you're still a ways off, the Father will run to you because we are his beloved. And his love for us is so perfect. And it has nothing to do with what we do for him. It's perfect. And that is a mind, you know, that's probably a good way of putting it. Right? It doesn't make any sense with us because everything in our culture is contingent on what we do, right? It's contingent on our actions. It's contingent on how good we are, but in God's eyes, we are his beloved. We are his, and he welcomes us home. Last one. You are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. Or one 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 of the versions says, you are the pride of my life. He's telling Jesus before he even begins his ministry that he's just excited. I'm proud of you. Go get him, tiger. Go do, go do it. Let's do this thing. Before Jesus does anything, he says he's pleased, pleased with him and proud. Let me ask you these. There's two questions here. Do you think that God is pleased with you? 
Like, if you're really honest with yourself, do you think that God, if you're sitting right, sitting right here and he'd come in, which he's here, just so you know, um, but let's say, like, he's sitting next to you, do you think that, like, his attitude towards you, he's pleased with you, he's proud of you? Or do you think he's disappointed in you? Like, this, the worst thing to ever hear is that I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. Oh, just be mad. Just yell or something. Don't be disappointed, you know? Don't, don't be disappointed in me. The way you see God will, is the way you answer that question. Do you feel like when you come to the Lord, he's pleased with you, or do you feel like when you come to him, he's disappointed? That he's disappointed in who you become or what you've done or what you've said or whatever, you feel like he's disappointed. But in Jesus, he says, with you I'm well pleased. So, there's, so there, here's, here's the good paradox here, right? When we make mistakes, when we sin, when we stray from his good plans, right? He has a good path for us, that's good. There's moments that disappoints God. When we choose less than his best, when we choose less than the best thing that's going to give us the fullness of his love and this life and the ability to minister and to reach and transform this world— that disappoints God because it's not choosing the best thing for us. The reason why God hates sin is not because he wants to hate sinners. It's because people choose less than what God can give them. People choose less than the perfect will of God, which is a better life, which is more fun, more enjoyable, more full of joy and peace and hope. And so God is disappointed when I choose a different way. It, he, it's, he doesn't delight in that. He doesn't want me to do that. Not because he's God and he's been waiting any, every day for Aaron to go that way. No, because I'm not choosing the best path. Right? So what I do matters. It doesn't matter in my, his love for me or that he calls me his own, but it matters in, his, in the ability for me to reach the fullness of my potential in him if I choose to do things that are not of him. And that disappoints God, not in a disappointed father, I'm disappointed in you, but in, oh my gosh, this, it could be so much better. This could save you so much pain. This could save you so much bitterness and hurt and disconnection from your family and strife and stress. This would just be a better, and it would be more fruitful. So there's moments where I, I do things and you do things and we do things that aren't part of God's plan and it's, and it's not his way. It's, not, it's disappointing. It's not what he desires you to do while still maintaining you're his beloved and still maintaining that you are his and that never changes. Psalm 30 says this, for, and I love this verse. This is, this is good. You might want to write this one down or something. Um, for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. The weeping may stay through the night. Rejoicing comes in the morning. And in Lamentations, it says, The steadfast love of God never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. All the things I do stray my heart from the Lord, or he, he doesn't desire me to do that, and he's disappointed in that. In a moment, he's proud. In a moment, I can move back on the path the way he wants me to be, where he wants me to go in a second. God's default is being proud of you. His default is being pleased with you. His default isn't, this person keeps screwing up. Why does he keep doing that? Why does Aaron keep saying those things? Why does he quit being a jerk? Why doesn't these things happen? His default is pleasure. His default is being pleased. His default is excitement and proud, and that's my boy. He just wants me to continue to get back on the path. Keep on the things that bring him pleasure and bring him the best life that he has for me. And while in moments I stray, and he that's not his plan. It's not what he wants. Just like my kids, when they do something, I'm like, that's not smart. Don't do that. You know, and there's moments of, nope, over here. You know, that's me picking up at their head if I could do that. <laughs> but it's me like, no, don't do that. Or like yesterday we're at Estes and Ella, Ella's like walking over the rocks to fall. And I'm like, Ella, no. I like yell at her to grab her, you know. And my disappointment and my frustration and my 
fear for her is a momentary is momentary. But my pleasure, my favor for her is forever. That's uh, God's default for you is being proud, whether you feel it or not. So it's kind of up to you. If you want to believe that God's proud of you, He's with you. You're His beloved. Why don't you come play? To close here, I want to, um, for Father's Day, I remember, I remember one time I used to play in this rock and roll band. Oh, yeah. Be excited. And uh, I don't know. There's no way of, like, bringing up I was in a band without sounding ridiculous. But I remember one time we were, like, we played. It was, like, one of the first times we played. And I remember, like, my dad came up to me. And he just, like, hugged me. And he was, like, I'm proud of you. And he had tears in his eyes. I was, like, whoa, he's proud of me for being in a rock and roll band. That's cool. Um, but then he would, like, share, he would, like, share everything we did with everyone. He would tell everyone about us, right? And there's a, so the Lord uses the same sentence twice in the gospel. The first time is what we've read, that you are my son. You're the one that I love and you, whom I'm well pleased. When he rips heaven open, he tells him when he's starting his ministry. The second time is towards the end of his ministry, of Christ's ministry. Matthew 16, I'm going to read it. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and his brother. And he led them up to the mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Transfigured, he was made perfect before him. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes were white as light. And behold, there that appeared to them was Moses and Elijah talking with them. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I can make three tents here, for one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Thanks, Peter. That's helpful. This is like a moment where you don't like try to put a tent up. You like try to take in the moment, right? This is not about this, but there's going to be times in your life when you don't need to figure it out or what's next. God just wants you to enjoy the moment. As a dad, there's times we don't have to make sure everything's good and everything's fine and we gotta do the next thing. You just enjoy the moment. Take pleasure in the moment. While he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and the voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and, and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and said, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. So the first time they, they say, he said, the Lord hears this, it's to begin his ministry. And the, set, the second time is later. It's different because uh, it's just Peter, James, and John. And then the two probably most iconic titans of faith, Moses and Elijah are there. And this time, the Lord rips heaven open, and for them there, he says, he tells them, this is my son. This is my beloved son. This is who I love. With him, I'm well pleased. And this time, it was a proclamation to all people. And it was even, it was really, honestly, a proclamation to us. Because we're reading the story today, and in that moment, we get we get to hear from God. This is my boy. I'm still proud of him. Just as proud as I was the first day, as proud as I am today, as proud as he is right now. This perfect love. So I want to pray for you. I feel like God just wants to, in, in a, just maybe in just a a very personal way um, as Rach sings this song. Um, he just wants to show you what the Father's love is again. And that might be really, really foreign, really strange. It's nothing that I can just tell you about, but the Lord wants you to experience it. So just with, if you just want to take, take this time as we sing this song, and I just want to pray that the Lord's, the Father's love, the him saying to you, I want you to hear the words from him. Let's just let's pray this out. Lord, would you just would you just speak to every heart here? 
would you say to every single person, every single person sitting in these chairs today, no matter how close they are to God or how far they are, that you would tell, say to them, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. Would you receive those words, each one of you? That God calls you his son or his daughter and he calls you his beloved because he loves you. And his per- love is perfect. Whether you feel like you're the worst or you feel like you're the best, the love never changes. From the Father, he would say, you are my beloved. And you, I'm well pleased. I am proud of you. I'm proud of who you become. I am proud to call you my son or daughter still. I know that things always haven't been easy and been perfect or haven't been the path you've maybe been on, but I want you to know I'm proud of you. I'm pleased with you. I find favor with you. I pray as we sing this song, would you just let, let that rest on you? Let that fill you? Think about that?